And now, a man-child more toxic than a comically large vat of spilled nuclear waste. Roll post. By the time I joined the group, there was already a Cyberpunk 2020 campaign, but I was later told that our DM, Manchild, had asked our university's anime and gaming club if anyone wanted to join a campaign he was running. For reference, both Manchild and most of his players were new to the TTRPG world, but we were in a school for art and our love for roleplaying, so they wanted to play. Another thing to note is Manchild is a film student, highly opinioned and stubborn. He was a fantastic storyteller and knowledgeable about the games he ran and played. I and everyone else in this story don't hate him, but his actions have caused us to never play TTRPGs with him. Side note, despite being a TTRPG, he hated backstories. He didn't want to read the notes we had about our characters, their lives, and other info, so he would never bring it up or use them in-game. I joined Group 2 as a contracted techie. I can't remember what happened before I joined, I'm sure I'll be told later, but the group had been split up into two different campaigns, with Manchild as the DM, Group 1 being locked up in jail and Group 2 being on the run and having side missions. Now, at this time I had played D&D 5e for years, but I had never played Cyberpunk, so I was excited to play a different system and have an in-person game instead of having it online due to my lack of knowledge of the system and world, and my stupidity in not asking questions, my character had little money and no armor. And I, the player, had little to no knowledge of guns which would be my downfall. But I loved my badass techie Geo and so did the rest of the players. Group 2 was doing a mission in San Francisco and we had sneaked into a facility. The party had to hide from the guards, and when one of my party members got caught, I thought I could shoot my rifle and not get seen. Manchild was very knowledgeable about guns, and I think he thought all of us would know about silencers or do my research, but I had no idea about them. Manchild didn't let me know I could get caught before the game and in session, resulting in Geo dying and a fight with the guards. Every other player had a character die before I got there, and said most of the party were playing new characters. While I was sad, it was the nature of cyberpunk, right? And time. We are already at the unraveling point. Experienced crabs will correctly identify this as the beginning of misunderstanding and where the seeds of mayhem are planted. However, I will give Manchild a point here in the beginning. Rifles making noise isn't particularly niche information, and the player should know that it's gonna get messy. Plus, this DM's vibe seems to err on the side of brutality. I'm going to assume that OP did not understand or discuss that walking in. Session zeros, people. Roll post. So, it was time to make a new character. Manchild had ruled that we couldn't play the same class, which I didn't understand since I hadn't played a techie for more than three sessions. But, whatever. I'll make a nomad, live, and call it a day. I was not trying to make the same mistake again. I made sure I had armor and a silencer on my gun. However, Manchild told me that I would have no money going into the session. I thought this would be fine as I would help Group 2 with a case and get cash in game. Nope. One of the players, who was the one who was giving us the contract, Walker, held on to the money and never paid us. But I needed money for gas, parking spots, etc. So I would ask Walker for cash. Walker, in-game, would get upset with me every time I asked, and when I asked to pay up front, Walker would say, too late, should have asked earlier. I wouldn't be so upset if, A, we didn't have to pay for literally everything to move forward with the story, and B, they wouldn't make fun of another player and I for constantly asking for money outside of the game. I get it, in-game it's a bit funny, but once it's outside of the game and making fun of the situation all the time, it felt more like they were picking on me and not my character. I would ask Manchild to at least help us out, but he just shrugged it off and told me to deal with it in-game. However, this is where the story starts, and I think this is an excellent time to talk about Group 1. While Group 2 was doing side missions and just whatever, Group 1, locked up in jail, had died with the exception of one character. The players had all died in one five-hour session, including a prison fight, an attempted escape, and an explosion. The one character who lived, Mitch, 
had woken up in a hospital wing to learn that all of his friends had died, caused by Walker, the player from Group 2. Mitch wanted revenge and assembled a new group, the player's new characters, to hunt down Walker. Group 1 was trying their best to figure out where Group 2 was, but Manchild didn't give any hints to find us. Walker gave Group 1 directions that Manchild didn't use and only used the one meant to be a dead end. This was supposed to lead to a big fight between Group 1 and Group 2, but we couldn't do it because they couldn't find us. They had no idea that Group 2 had even gone to San Francisco. And when they did find out, we were already in LA. What made Group 1 pissed was that on the days they weren't playing their session, they would listen to Group 2's session and vice versa, so they knew out of game where we were, but didn't know how to get the information in game. This is just getting laughable at this point. On one hand, thanks for roleplaying and trying not to metagame. On the other hand, if they haven't already, asking the DM to give an olive branch is not unreasonable. I'm going to assume that they already did that because while it hasn't been mentioned in the story, if they didn't, they would be so deep in stupid town it wouldn't even be funny anymore. Going several sessions unable to push the story forward and not even trying correspondence with the person running the game is stupid. But in the nature of fairness, if they did try and fail at that, the DM likely has a plan and needs more time to prep, which is the most likely option. So waiting could be the ultimately better option. However, this is where metagaming could prove useful. If all else has failed, using meta knowledge to push ever so slightly closer to the other group would be a suitable test on the DM. If the DM is permitting it, then keep pushing. If the DM's reaction is to shut it down or close off dead ends, then take it as a sign that there is still more content to work through. Anyways, back to the story. In desperation, they went to someone named The Collector, which everyone knew was bad news, but with no choice they traded memories from their techie player, Siri, for information. This would piss off the corporation that hired them to track down Walker. As Manchild explained, the Collector having Ciri's memories would leave the corporation defenseless, causing the group leader, Ocampo, to be ordered to kill Ciri. Ciri's player, Fox, at this time was slowly reaching their breaking point with Manchild. Ciri was constantly getting their characters killed one after another, having the highest character death amongst our group. One of the biggest reasons their character kept getting killed was because they would play, quote, good characters and be told good characters would die in Night City. As if there are no good people in a post-apocalyptic world, Manchild would joke that they were the president of the character Death Club, which Fox did not like. So, Ocampo was left with a hard decision, killing their friend or disobeying the higher up. I should mention that we are all at Manchild's house having a double session, so Group 2 was sitting on his couch listening while the rest of the group was in the basement, not allowed to hear this part. Ocampo hatched a plan. He took Siri's hand and burned it on a stove to remove her fingerprints, led her to the docks and told Siri to leave because the corporation wanted her dead, while handing her a duffel bag full of money and a blue glass. Now, Blue Glass was a drug that Siri was addicted to, but, as Fox would explain, she was smart enough not to have any till she was deemed safe. Siri left and we thought that was the end of the story for now. But later that session, they discovered that Siri had run herself into a wall with a bus due to being high on Blue Glass. Fox was pissed as they didn't agree with their character dying that way and wanted to discuss what happened to Siri with Manchild after Group 2's session. He kills their character by justifying that she would have been high and done it. Okay, at first I had some doubts that Fox was being unfairly killed given the nature of the rifle incident. But if it was already previously established that she was smart enough to manage her addiction to the point of survival, and the DM just kills her off screen without so much as a roll, I'm getting a feeling that there's a reason she has the most character deaths out of anyone else, and I think we're going to find out exactly what that reason is very soon. Roll post.
Fox had a backup character already made, which was the usual thing with the group since we had characters die all the time. We always had another one lined up. However, Manchild told us that he had killed Fox's backup because she was a liability, even though she had nothing to do with Siri. Still, Manchild told Fox, that's what you get for making a backup character. <laughs> Okay, the DM definitely has a problem with Fox. He's unnecessarily flexing on her either to stroke his ego or just to kick the player. This left Group 1 without a techie, which they needed to move forward with their plan and the corporation upset them because Ocampo didn't kill Siri. What did Group 2 do in their session? Nothing. We fucked around because we couldn't do anything until Group 1 found us. By the end of the day, we were tired. Fox was upset, and we were left unsure of what to do. Manchild asked what class Ocampo thought they needed for the group so that Fox could play it for their next character, and they replied with a techie. But because he had that stupid rule about not playing the same class, Fox could not play another techie. After a few sessions of Group 1 not being able to find Group 2, Walker had a giant sign that said, Find me in LA on a truck. Did we have a big fight? Did we finally have that confrontation that we've been waiting for for months? No. Group 1 upset a gang in LA and killed everyone in Group 1. We did have one moment between Walker and Mitch, but in the end Mitch died. Everyone was done with Cyberpunk and didn't want to play anymore. There were more Group 2 sessions, but many of us were just tired of the campaign and did not want to play anymore. I wish this was the end of it, but no. I still have four more games to go through. This is an example of a DM that is so consumed by draconian rules and pettiness that he ruined his own game just for the sake of screwing people over. He could have had an epic fight and a complete climax of the story arc. Everybody would be happy. But no, he needed to go in on this player for no perceived reason. I suspect and hope that we're going to find out the reason soon enough. Let's go, part two now. Fifth edition Audacity, The Manchild Saga Part Two. TLDR, Manchild punishes player for not playing the game the way he wanted to. I also want to mention that these events happened over two years ago and we don't play games with Manchild anymore. This was just a way to get all of my feelings out of my chest and finally let go of all the anger that I had felt for so long. But anyway, after Cyberpunk, I decided I would run a D&D 5e with the group, my homebrew world with Manchild as a player. Again, for reference, Manchild had never played D&D 5e. He had seen some critical role, and again, so did most of the other players. So, I would do what every DM would teach you, how to make your character, what the world is like, and break down the campaign. I had mentioned that this would be a mainly role-playing game, as this is how I prefer to run my games. I should add that Manchild doesn't see the appeal of role-playing and doesn't understand why the rest of us interact and talk in character and develop friendships. As he will tell me, we're already friends in real life, why do you need to talk to each other in a game like we aren't? I, again, mentioned to him that this is mainly a role-playing D&D game, but he agrees to play in it anyways. Even though I said it would be a one-shot, I figured it was going to be a campaign, so I asked everyone to write a little backstory. They were a little hesitant about giving me anything. What I did not mention in part one is that not only did Manchild not care about people's backstories if you had a secret in them, he would just tell everyone at the table, basically losing the fun of having a reveal later down the line. So pretty much everyone was scared to give me a backstory. Well, everyone but Manchild. He didn't want to write one, so I ended up writing his backstory for the sake of time. Manchild wanted to be a half-orc noble fighter, so I wrote him as a nobleman's love child with a half-sister and half-brother who hated him, so they sent him away. Honestly, the first session went okay. It wasn't until I got deeper into the story that it got worse. 
one of the biggest things that he would completely metagame by either giving or talking about information his character would know nothing about, or bossing other players around when his character wasn't there to discuss with them. Right before our first session, he would go to his local game store and play Adventurer's League. Which is fine. I like Adventurer's League. It teaches new players how to play the game and teaches new DMs how to run one-shots. However, because Manchild would go to Adventurer's League, he would constantly compare my game to it. He would tell me that we roleplayed too much, even though I told him that ahead of time, or that I was too loose with the rules. He also complained that he never had enough money even though they had a lot and it wasn't hard to get more. Funny how he would complain about that but let my character go through the same thing and brush me off. He also got mad at my players for not knowing how to play their characters. Of course, they don't know how to play their characters. Everyone but me and Walker had not played D&D before this game. So jumping from Cyberpunk to D&D was a hard adjustment. But it didn't stop him from bossing people around on how to play their character, how to use their actions in a fight, yada yada yada. He would also yell at the other players for having fun and taking some time to fool around rather than keeping track of the mission. Their fooling around lasted maybe 10 or 20 minutes in actual time. Okay, really quickly, this guy sucks for two reasons. One, he's a poor match for what the party's going for, which is unfortunate, but at this point, that's on him for sticking around. Like that last scrape of dog poop, he just won't let go, and before you know it, he's tracked it all over your carpet and the whole room stinks. Next, he's a control freak. Where everyone else is playing tabletop role-playing game, he's playing tabletop turn-based tactics. It isn't a wrong way to play at all, but he was told what the game was gonna be, actively played in said game, and is now complaining because of the same things he chose to participate in. This guy stinks, and not even for the reasons I've mentioned already. I mean, I would literally bet two Crate Crab plushies and a Sand Dollar that this guy smells like a Magic the Gathering tournament. Anyways, roll post. I even invited my boyfriend, who had only met the guy a couple of times at a small convention, but he wanted to come and guest play in one of my sessions. So he made the trip to my university. Little did he know he would be greeted with Manchild yelling at everyone to hurry up because he was quote, excited that there was finally combat. He even yelled at another player because he thought their current plan he had wasn't going to work, so they would have to think of a different idea. Manchild kept yelling at him about what to do and how to do it, and how can you not know your character sheet by now? Which resulted in that player crying and leaving the table. I ended up shutting down due to the amount of yelling and screaming and feeling like shit that a couple of my players had to leave due to stress caused by Manchild. And his childish aggression has finally surfaced. This won't be the last or the most explosive of his rages, but we have officially raised the stakes of his buffoonery. Be an annoying pissant when things aren't going exactly the way you want? Fine, sure. We'd all be happier if you stepped on a Lego and were subsequently hospitalized, but by all means, have a seat at our table. But when he's emotionally attacking other people for no other reason than that he is not directly controlling them, makes me think that he has somehow missed the entire point of group interaction. Just wait till this guy finds out what multiplayer is. If he found out other people had autonomy in the slightest, his entire perception of reality would shatter. But that said, there is no greater insult that I can bestow other than simply letting his actions present themselves. Roll post. Fox went home for the summer, so we had them over Discord, but every time they would speak, Manchild would speak over them. I would try to get them involved, however, it was hard when Manchild would not only sit near me, but he was a naturally loud person and easily overpowered someone. So imagine trying to speak over them when you are online and in a different city. In my years of playing D&D, I never ran into a player that I couldn't talk to if I were having an issue. But it felt like every time I would try to fix in-game, when he would just yell and insult NPCs, they wouldn't listen to him. If he metagamed, I could call him out, etc. But nothing was working. Shadow, one of my friends, had been listening to the campaign online, 
tried to give me advice, and even jumped in as a guest player to help keep Manchild in his place. But he would again overpower everyone. I was completely lost and had no idea what to do next. After weeks of the same shit over and over again, Fox and I decided that we would talk to him about it in person. I had asked him to meet with us at my work, which was always empty since I had the morning shift. Fox and I would talk about problems, and he would just say that, um, in Adventurer's League, it's like this, or, well, when I was playing Adventurer's League, we kept telling him that my game was not Adventurer's League and that I run things differently, that everyone should have a say in the game, not just him. When the conversation went nowhere, I couldn't hold back the stress that has been there for weeks and I began to cry. We eventually came to some agreement, and I thought everything was good. Okay, I have like a million problems with him comparing a homebrew D&D game to Adventurer's League, but I'm not even going to get into that rule post. But I was wrong. The party was in a city trying to collect members of the government to let them know that there was a cult trying to bring back ancient elemental dragons that they fought many years ago. They found out that one of the lady was a part of the cult, and instead of talking to the police or discussing it with his party, he went to her house and confronted her, which managed to get away because she was a high-level wizard with time stop. So not only did the party lose a really good lead, he yelled at the mayor of the city, claiming it was her fault, which kicked them out of the town. I was fed up at this point, and Fox and I had gone back and talked to him again and again about our issues, but he didn't listen. If you were wondering why I kept letting it happen, Honestly, I don't know, maybe I was trying to please everyone, or perhaps it was because I was scared of getting yelled at again. He was our friend, and we wanted him to be included in our games. I had even reset the whole world, changed his character alignment, and even then nothing changed. Whenever the spotlight was not on him, he would try and make it all about him again. When Fox and I sat down and talked about Manchild, we were worried about his attitude because Fox was going to start a new campaign later on and we didn't want to share the same mistakes. So we messaged him that we wanted to talk. He told us that he was meeting our friend at his university and we could meet him there. We told Manchild our issues and he would just tell us we were wrong or didn't listen to us. This time, Fox and I were crying and started to shut down as Manchild began yelling over and over again. I felt so bad for our other friend for trying to help, but even he couldn't get through to him. We left the conversation drained and eventually gave in to his demands, even convinced Fox that they should complain to the group because no one would listen to him. This would be the last time we met before the pandemic, resulting in all of us having the session online rather than in person. It was a mess, in fairness, I was completely unorganized and there were more people than I could handle. But the worst of it all, I couldn't shut out Manchild. Usually I could focus on a different person when he would yell, but online? It was like hearing everyone's voices all at once turned up to 200%. I began to shut down and get angry, and decided that this would be the end of the campaign. Sorry, this is going to be a bit of a nitpick, but I personally feel like online should at least make the handling of Manchild, like, 30 times easier. Deafen, Mute, and Kick are all amazing features that would contribute to his downfall, but my personal favorite is Ban. Anyways, let's wrap up the story. This attitude didn't stop at my game. My friends also ran a game as co-DMs in a homebrew system. And even in this game where he didn't know the system, told them how the game should be run, and got angry when it was a heavy roleplay game, even though he was told that's how it was going to be run. He would throw them out of the window when he didn't like the rules. For example, in this game, they were all magic users, and they were told repeatedly that no one should know you are using black magic. What does Manchild do? Use black magic in front of NPCs in the wide open. The worst part is that he would talk about how bad the game was and that I should be glad I'm not in the game because it was a mess. He would put me in the middle by coming to me to hear his shit 
and I didn't know if I should tell the DMs what was going on. In the end, I told them, and after much debate, he was kicked out of the game. Not all of it ended in a shit show. Due to this, I made a whole new campaign with Fox, Shadow, and both DMs from the homebrew game, and it's been going great. Again, I wish this was the end, but no. We still have two more games to talk about. There's enough content left for one or two more parts, so with that, I'll catch you in the next video. Till next time.